Welcome, Dejoli. I am super excited to be talking to you. Thank you for having me, Veda. That's wonderful. Yeah, you're such a light. And I know we've connected in the past and talked a little bit. And the reason I wanted to invite you to have this conversation is because you said a part of your mission is to bring more joy and more play I don't know mm -hmm. if it's in work or life or overall um mm -hmm. into people's lives kind of going forward so I I love that awesome I love it too I'm learning more and more about it <laughs> enjoying <laughs> myself is that has that been a part of your own journey Oh, yes, absolutely. I mean, uh, I had a pretty serious childhood and and it didn't give me the opportunity to really play in in the sense of letting all my defenses down and being vulnerable and being open and all of that. I didn't have that. So as I've moved into adulthood, I've had to learn how to play because I know how essential it is to play. And then uh, it brings in more joy. And then that spurs on more play. So it's really kind of one thing leads to another until, you know, you're you're in that space a lot more. I'm in my, that space a lot more than I used to be. I love that. Play and joy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love how it sounds. And so what, um, how can we do that? Because we started talking a little bit before the recording and it seems like, especially in life, but especially in work situations, people are so serious. Very serious. I mean, I used to be one of them. I mean, I mean, if uh, some people uh, see me today, depending on what I'm thinking about or what my um, agenda is for that day, I might be pretty serious too. But um I think it's really important for me, especially to experience as much play as I can, like uh, celebrate my little steps. That's one of the things that's one of the things that started me doing more joyful things, more uh, play things, because, um, you know, even if it's a little thing like, uh, you know, if I do something in my business, that's that's just a tiny thing. Like um, I sent my um, manuscript to the printer. And, and I was like, Ooh, I did it. And so I went to the ice cream shop and had an ice cream, you know, that was, that's just a little thing. Um, and then another time I decided I would just go swing at the park, you know, cause I did something and I was like celebrating. So the more I am conscious of the little steps that I'm taking, the more I do little playful things. Like, um, one of the things that I, lo I love to do is I paint river rocks and put little sayings on them and then I hide them somewhere in the community oh. and on the back on the back of it it said I, I might put a saying I have one that's uh that I put out that a lot of people like and it's called play in the puddles oh. and on the back of it I said if you find this you can keep it or you can hide it for someone else and so you know it's just kind of like one of those playful things that I like to do, it kind of gives me that little, you know, ooh, I got somebody, somebody's going to find this. I know they are. <laughs> so, and then I go on Facebook and I put a hint, you know, where it might be in the community. And the, and so I get, a, I get a lot of fun out of that. Um, I'm also a painter. So sometimes I just, my play is about slapping paint on the canvas you know so and then seeing where it goes because it ends up being something more I think more serious <laughs> but it also can be playful so I love that and, and you have you have to be conscious and for me I have to be consciously creating moments when I can play because mm -hmm. because if it isn't natural like it wasn't natural for me because of my childhood I didn't grow up with that sense of life is playful for me it was life is serious <laughs> life is dangerous life can be really you know hurtful and I had to I went through a lot of healing you know to get to a place where I I could allow myself to show myself and be vulnerable and and play you know so it's very important as a as an aspect of healing to um just 
create moments you know it's kind of like when i say you say take pictures of the of the family for the family album well that's a moment that's a a memory so for me play is a also a memory like going and swinging in the park that's a memory and it's also playful oh i love that create moments and memories of play and joy Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and um i just love kind of when we started talking like i love your energy like the place that you're at right now it just like it feels so i don't know so comforting and it feels calming and uplifting oh that's so awesome thank you <laughs> really really good energy so i just felt like even my body like my shoulders dropped and ah, it's just fun it's awesome um and I wanted to ask you, as you talk about this, because when we talk about the seriousness in work, um, it doesn't have to be like that, because I know that there are, it's more of an exception, but there are leaders who have so much fun and they joke around and everybody loves them and they're accomplished. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, so the fun and play and joy is not exclusive of accomplishment and fantastic results that's exactly right that's exactly right so why do <laughs> most of us or many of us i would say from my experience that is that is more of an exception most leaders that i worked with and environments i've been they're serious and mm -hmm. it's kind of feels like you have to stifle that part because mm -hmm. you think, oh my god if i say it will it come out the wrong way you know nobody else is doing it so you're like kind of like don't bring that part of you to certain situations in work why yeah. why is that that we are I would say we're afraid to be playful joyful which is part of our nature I think I think it is a, a fear a fear of letting uh letting ourselves be seen yeah. and uh, being vulnerable because people a lot of people have the misimpression of vulnerability being uh unsafe but in in essence, it's actually you're safer being vulnerable and mm -hmm. um, allowing yourself to take in all of the, I mean, it's like a receiving, you're receiving um, the gift of other people seeing you and um, appreciating you. That's a, that's a gift. And so, you know, I say to some people when they're at work and they're having a bad day, I say, go to the bathroom and get in the stall and dance <laughs> dance dance around in that stall until you get your energy back up and you go out oh I feel pretty good you can't touch me <laughs> you can't get me down <laughs> so yeah it's a it's a a way of just moving your energy I have a, a client who I um she's kind of gets kind of stuck in her negativity mm -hmm. so I tell her Twice a day, no matter what you're doing, bend over and touch your toes three times. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and she just like, I don't think that's, uh, well, guess what? It worked. <laughs> I think it's about moving your body and moving your mind and moving that creative energy through yourself, you know, and it, it is, it is, like you said, an exception to the rule because we do have that um, constriction most of us do and we uh, hold ourselves in and we don't expand ourselves because we have that fear of what's going to happen you know uh where's the next shoe going to fall <laughs> what's going to go what's going to happen and so i what i've learned is through my life experience is that on the other side of that fear it's okay mm -hmm. and that fear can last for a long time or it can only last for 90 seconds you know so mm -hmm. you take your chances you make that vulnerable uh, movement that creative movement and on the other side of it it could be ec ecstasy could be joy could be oh my god I did that <laughs> and I you know I've been going through that I can't believe I did that <laughs> but <laughs> But, you know, I, I've, I've enjoyed all of that. And, and I, I got to the other side of it and I said, oh my gosh, you did that. And yeah, okay, you did it. <laughs> and then there's something else. So, you know, yeah, uh, it's, it's a, a matter of uh, allowing ourselves the freedom 
which we don't all have that freedom of um, movement and the energy of our creative inside mm. to come out to come out so mm. i love that yeah so talk about the nine like so what you're describing is so on the other side is everything that we want the happiness the joy mm -hmm, right mm -hmm. those those good feeling good feelings mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that we all desire and want so how how can we make it last 90 seconds instead of like how can life, we make instead of a lifetime yeah, instead, instead of, that, of like daily all you know kind of like a constant daily well, it is it is an intentionality i'm sorry i had to itch my eye um because you have to be aware that you're not playing you know you may not you may think you are but you're not and so that attention of oh i'm not playing and then the intention to play has to be there so when you when i started meditating um i i definitely recommend meditation to move you into a whole different space of um, allowing yourself to expand into creativity um i started listening to um, a meditation on um, insight timer which i really like someone introduced me to it and i was like oh my goodness you know but there's one voice that i really like so i listened to him and he he taught me a lesson and that is if you just pretend to smile whether you feel like smiling or not if you can raise your your yeah just like that just like that mm -hmm. if you if you do that and you don't even feel like smiling it signals the brain i can tell you miracles about the brain which we can get into but it signals the brain these muscles all the muscles of your face are connected to the brain mm -hmm. and if you change the lip to up as far as you can before you're like oh yeah right you know so but you lift your lips and that signals your brain yeah to that you're smiling there's something good happening mm -hmm. and so even if you don't feel like it you get that you know instant dose of dopamine or or serotonin something positive as opposed to the cortisol which is the addictive um little dose that we get that we keep in that in that depression in that space of I'm not good enough I can't do this I'm not happy why should I play you know that kind of thing there's got to be some sort of motivation you know to be aware and then to do it and so um, yeah but the I learned about the the muscles of the face and realized and just like you know your smile is contagious Oh, thank you. And, and, <laughs> anybody's, anybody's smile is contagious, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And if we allow ourselves that moment of, oh, I'm smiling and she's smiling and oh, and they're smiling, you know, so it's kind of like, it's kind of like um, our good stuff gets spread right. around. But you know what our not so good stuff gets spread around too. <laughs> so you make your choice. You know, I choose to be uh, in a joyful space. I choose to learn how to play. So as I as I keep learning, I I can share other things. But um, as I keep learning, I I see myself allowing more positivity in my life. Mm. So it's about allowing as opposed to forcing something in my life. You know, I I um I do things without expectation of reward or anything else. And and being that way, I can gather things into me that um are positive that I haven't actually forced to happen I can I want to give you an example okay? yeah 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 okay the other day I met with a friend at a coffee shop in a town about 30 miles from here yeah. now we could have met two miles away at a coffee shop but she was having physical therapy in this town so I said why don't we just meet over there and the place is called the spot. The it's, spot. A, it's a coffee shop, 
right? In the middle of this town. So we go there, we meet, we're talking back and forth. And I'm saying, I don't know why I'm here. I, you know, why did God invent people? That was a stupid thing to do. You know, <laughs> I was just like, I'm like, oh my God, Dejali, you're so crazy. So we're sitting there talking and she's telling me how many good things I've done. And I'm telling her how many good things she's done. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, four or five people come in and they've got a big sign with them called human tax human human trafficking task force oh wow and i was like oh okay god i know <laughs> because part of my history is that i was trafficked and i and i've worked for um 16 years um as a speaker all over the country talking about trafficking and and healing and uh child sex abuse and all the rest of it and so I looked at that group of people and I looked back at my friend and I said, I got to talk to them. <laughs> so I got up and I walked over and I started talking to them about what are you doing and what's going on? And they were saying, well, we're the task force, blah, 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 for the county. And I was just like, still in my head, I'm going, I can't believe the, they showed up at this moment, <laughs> you know? So as we're talking and I told them that I was a, a survivor, they said, oh, we've got to have you come in and talk because there's a conference uh, in Southern Alabama on the 26th of January and you might be, you know, so it was kind of like, oh my God, you know, out of nowhere, here we are playing because all we were doing is having coffee. There was no other reason for me to be there. Yeah. And we could have done it two miles away. Instead, I would drove 30 miles away to go to the spot you know, because I believe that what happened was all the connections that took place was I was in the right spot at the right time. Yep. And that was because I decided to play that day by going and having a cup of coffee with a friend. Yeah. I mean, and I, and I orchestrated. Right. It was divinely orchestrated. And you never know when you're going to be in the right place at the right time. And so when I learned how to, when I've, as I've learned how to play and be, a, be in those places, it's been a, mir a miracles happen, you know, connections happen. Not that, not that that's going to lead to anything, but it's just, it just made me know that there was a reason why I'm here and it keeps getting reinforced over and over again, you know. I love that. Yeah. I love that because it reminds me of the quote from the alchemist. I have it written down here is that because I was reading it, rereading it recently. Uh -huh. And the author says the words luck and coincidence is with those words that the universal language is written. Uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, and so yeah. like, so paying attention to these magical moments, the synchronicities, mm -hmm. um, beautiful example so how do we allow, I like how you say allow versus make it a task and another to do to invite play and joy in our day to day? Well, I think, you know, in, in the mornings when we get up, we're totally open. And then as we go through the day, we start closing. Mm -hmm. So in that open space, Create in the universe an intention of, I'd like to have an opportunity to play today. I'd like an opportunity to make connections today. I'd like my heart to be open today. Mm -hmm. So as, as I make those intentions, that brings in the opportunity. That's the in, inflow mm -hmm. opportunities for me to have those things that I want. If I don't make an intention as a person who has to learn to play, um, that's not going to happen. I can sit up here all day and say, oh yeah, I, you know, they went off on and had a pizza party, but you know, mm, I wasn't feeling that great. So I stayed home. Well, you know, what if you went to that pizza party, even if you were feeling not so good and did this with your face <laughs> and went ahead, you would have had a blast, you know, you could have danced, you could have had pizza, you could have met something, somebody great, you know, just, all kinds of things. You have to allow yourself to have the intention of having play in your day. It's it's basically when you get up in the morning and you're open. And if you forget during the day, you can always put something out, you know, to remind you to play. I'll show you this. 
It's a little ducky. Yeah, yes. a little rubber ducky. A little rubber ducky, and it's in the in the shape of a mermaid. Oh, I love that. <laughs> so, so one of my favorite things is these little yellow duckies. I have them all over my house. Mm -hmm. And I remember them from like when my son was was in elementary school. I think they did them from for different charities and money money gathering opportunities the, all the little yeah. duckies in all kinds of shapes and forms yeah yeah i i know uh, around here they have a, a rubber ducky uh, race down the river we have a several rivers in this area of the mountain and so they have a, a like a festival and one of the things they do is they put all these rubber duckies with people's names on them in this river and they they all cheer along the the river and all that stuff it's really fun mm -hmm. to watch them go down the river of course they're all fished out at the end they're not left to you know pollute anything but it's fun to see all these little yellow rubber duckies going down the river <laughs> and so as a child i'm going to tell you the story of the of that little rubber ducky Okay. That rubber ducky, not this one, the mermaid, but I have I have the original one. Um, I didn't have a great childhood, but my mother did take me to a department store when I was probably three or four. And it was the first time I had seen so many bright lights and colors. And I was just like, wow, look at this, you know? Oh, my God. And I got to the checkout with my mother and I knew she wasn't going to buy me anything. But I looked in the, I was short, of course, three or four years old, I was short. So I, I couldn't see the top of the counter, but I could see right in front of me. And there was a bin of little toys, little, you know, there were tin soldiers, there were um, rubber duckies, there were different things. So I wanted that rubber ducky and I couldn't, I knew I couldn't ask for it. But that rubber ducky said to me, I know you're not happy right now, but everything's going to be okay. Oh, wow. now how do you get that 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 stayed with me my entire life as a matter of fact oops I put a <laughs> you can't see it I, oh, okay okay you have a tattoo, have a tattoo oh wow <laughs> of a rubber ducky on my arm that I put on my arm at age 70 <laughs> wow yeah it was my celebration of life that I had you know, made it to 70 and I was happy and I was, you know, doing, you know, doing what I wanted to. And I was still healing. I wasn't finished. I'm still not finished, but um, I had more joy in my life and, and the rubber ducky meant so much to me. Well, as I was doing my healing process, I had told people that I really love yellow, little yellow rubber duckies, right? <laughs> So, so people just started giving me ducks and I have a cabinet full of ducks <laughs> and, and I ended up at 70 putting one on my arm and every day her name is hope and every day I look at it and I say I gotta I can't figure out how to do that there you go there yeah. she is yeah and her name is her, her name is hope and I look at it every day and I say there's always hope you know that you can you're there's always hope that things are going to be better there's always hope that you can help somebody. There's always hope. So if we didn't have hope, we would only buy one egg at the store instead of a dozen. <laughs> okay, I like that. So it's like ducky chickens. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you get it. <laughs> but that, you know, that's uh, how I look at it is that, you know, you have to allow yourself the uh, the the opportunities to grow your willingness to have play in your life and, mm -hmm. and it takes it takes intentionality when you're not used to playing yeah. but knowing the importance of play because the importance of play is that it allows you to get out of not only yourself but out of the drip 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 of cortisol which keeps you in the negative mm -hmm. like if, most of us are overflowing with cortisol <laughs> yeah and and we don't have we don't make opportunities for us to bring in the other, the positive. So um, by making that intention first thing in the morning, I allow myself moments during the day where I can be playful. And even if it is just looking at that cabinet and seeing 15 little ru yellow rubber duckies, <laughs> that's, that's good enough. I can smile about that, you know. 
I love that. Yeah, because I mean, when you talk about waking up and setting an intention, we can already, from the moment we wake up, feel that, oh my God, so many things I have to do, get ready, get mm-hmm. this done, get that done. And then so many things at work, so many yeah. other things they have to get done. And we can wake up with that cortisol. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, mom, yeah. of course. Already, yeah. It's a it's one of the things that um I think Joe Dispenza talks about it. Um, you know, uh, just almost anyone who talks about meditation and waking up your day with intentionality rather than just I gotta pop up out of bed and start looking at my phone and I gotta get this, and I gotta do coffee, I gotta, you know. I it's it's a matter of decision. You know, I was I was on Kathy Heller's podcast the other day, and she was talking about being a radio as a receiver of this energy. And we put out energy and we receive energy. So I can tune it and I love it because as a child, I didn't have choice. I didn't have a choice of what I wanted in my life. I was told what I was going to get. <laughs> and so as an, as an adult, knowing that I have these choices, I can tune that receiver to whatever I want. And if I wake up in the morning and I've, I have not been uh, conscious and I've got it on rock and roll, I'm like, oh, I got to get going. I got to get going. But if I have it on, uh, my intention for the day is, right? So if I do that, then I can have more opportunities for joy and for play in my life. Mm-hmm. If I don't do it, then I'm consciously, whether, you know, I always used to say, and I still do, is that we make decisions whether or not we are conscious of it. Every moment we're making a decision. So my decision when I wake up is to allow joy in my life, allow peace in my life and allow play in my life. Mm, I love that. I love that. Tell us, so what are you doing right now? What it is that you're focused on? Uh, Well, I'm focused on um, trying to get more, um, speaking of uh, engagements because I, I want it, like these podcasts. I love that you asked me to be on your podcast um, yeah. because I want the message to get out that even though you may have had a horrible childhood, there are opportunities that you can, that you can bring joy and play and love and abundance into your life that you may not have ever dreamed of um, may not have even been an, you know, a blink in your eye that that's possible. You open up to the possibilities. One of the things that I uh, learned early in my recovery was always ask questions. Mm. Just ask, ask the question, be curious. Why did you do that? Why did you say that? Mm -hmm. Is there a possibility that there's something else you could have said or done? You know, always, Uh, always, always. (laughs) So (laughs) isn't that funny? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but there's always a, a possibility you know yeah yeah and you have had um your career you know your work in um I don't know but it sounds like a big part of your life has been focused on on healing mm-hmm. but also like you've written books and help helped others heal mm-hmm. from trauma Mm-hmm. Yeah, when I um, when I first started um, this work, um, it, it wasn't a paid gig. It was just I went from conferences to conferences to conferences, and wow. I spoke at Indiana University in the criminal justice department about uh, satanic cult abuse and um, healing from the results of that, which for me was uh, compartmentalizing the memories into human being or into parts of me, which was multiple personality. And then to learn how to integrate all of that through the healing process, through the therapy that I did and the work that I did, um, that to me was my work. Because prior to that, I I felt like I was just like doing one day at a time, like you were saying. I mean, I worked at different places and uh, I was very good at what I did you know, but it was, I was more underpaid for my ability. Let me just put it that way. And as a woman, that's not untyp- un- untypical. It's very typical, but, um, I didn't, I didn't know that there was a possibility that I could do more. 
but because and I was like oh my god I can't believe they're you know putting me on disability well that was my opportunity believe it or not I mean I look back and I say oh god I went with I went dragging my heels and you know I don't want to do that kind of thing into oh that was my opportunity to start telling people about what happened because most people don't know or don't want to know um, about this kind of nefarious stuff that goes on. Mm -hmm. And I, so I went to my first conference as a speaker. And um, one of the people in the audience was a professor at Indiana University. He was a, a judge, a lawyer, and a professor. And he had found a satanic uh, ritual site around Indiana University. So he was very interested. And he said, I was the most uh, together person I thought that was rather ironic uh, together person who had um, experienced that and so I spoke for 16 years around the country doing that that was my work even though I wasn't quote working at a job I was doing that and then doing my own personal work of healing um, so that that's that's kind of what I did now I've I've delved into you know my art that I do and that and my writing I've always been a writer mm -hmm. and um, changed lives I think through that because when I would go to these conferences I had my books and my art to show and um, writing books too you yeah on healing yes it was on healing it was on not only the um, healing but the experience of and exposing people to the um reality of satanic ritual abuse and trafficking and um, the the resulting uh, mental uh, state that you can be in from experiencing that deep trauma wow. and then to move out of that because the last time I spoke which was really a kind of a, a funny thing uh, <laughs> I spoke at the inaugural uh, conference of the Me American Mental Wellness Association Mm -hmm. in, in Hershey, Pennsylvania. Okay. And um, there were all kinds of people there. There were uh, mostly they were for the first time I had went to a conference where it wasn't all survivors, <laughs> you know, and um, there were therapists there, there were social workers, there were doctors, there were psychiatrists. And um, they were all saying that the results of this kind of abuse, multiple personality, couldn't be healed. Couldn't be you. You're you're like your fate is your fate. <laughs> and I'm, I was standing back there and saying, "Hmm, hmm, how's that? How's that working? Because I'm here and I've written these books and I, you know, I'm here. Look at me." <laughs> and um. So it was just kind of a, a waking up. And when I did my speech, there was a uh, there were several people in the audience that were uh, talking about how hard it was for them to put their patients in a in in house psychiatric ward. And I said, you know, that was the most important and best thing that anybody could have ever done to me because that's the first time I felt safe. Well, wow. I, I felt so safe to tell the story that nobody could get me inside that hospital because I was afraid. Most people who have been through that kind of experience are very afraid. They're told that, you know, things can happen to you and your family and your pets and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And so I, I had to live in fear most of my life until I got to that place where somebody put me in the hospital and I was like, oh my God, I have... 30 days of peace and quiet and nobody going to get me. Well, I use that opportunity to uh, allow my parts to come out and draw. They wrote, they spoke. It was just like, okay, we got this. <laughs> it was hard. It was a very hard time. I have to say I was, there were moments when I was crawling around on that cold linoleum floor when I was saying, why the hell did I get here? <laughs> why did I do this? But it, it ended up being a good experience. And so those people in the audience at that conference were like, oh, that's so relieving because I thought, you know, how terrible it was that I had to do that to my, and I said, no, 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 no. It, know that that was the best thing that you could probably have done for that person if they use the opportunity see I used the opportunity which not everybody did but I used it to learn about myself and about how to heal myself because shortly after I got out of my first hospital stay I 
uh, found a therapist who knew how to treat um, the results of this kind of abuse. And unfortunately, she died five years later, which put me on my own, which made me have to be intuitive about my own healing. I had to learn. And uh, there, at the time, not that many therapists were out there who were able to deal with this. They hadn't been trained. A lot of people didn't even believe it. <laughs> and um, then it just got to uh, myself saying, well, I'm not ever probably ever going to find somebody like her. Her name was Harry Herbie Lewis. Um, but I'm going to do this. She asked me to write a book and I'm going to write a book. Well, I ended up writing three books about the healing process and then how other people can heal their wounds. Mm. Not just about, you know, this kind of abuse, but um, any kind of wound, like a loss of a parent or a loss of a child or a lot, you know, even moving 10 times in, in 10 years. That's what I did. Um, that, that in itself is a big um, trauma. Yeah. Or, or a divorce even, you know, so. Yeah, it doesn't have to be. um I mean, the what you've gone through sounds um, horrific, and um, you know, but many people have gone through maybe I don't know how to say it, not as big, or um, I guess that's a trauma with the capital T, but like of like really where it's hundred percent recognizable. But um, even you know, kids who have grown up in emotionally unstable and unsafe environments, you know, it can be obviously different degrees, different expressions. And um, again, not to the extent of severity, um, but I wanted to ask you, so how, you know, you like, because many of us have gone through different things where, you know, the childhood wasn't the perfect childhood. Um and again, it does, it might not have been physical abuse and kind of the level of physical, um, in addition to the mental impact, um, trauma that happened to, to somebody, but how, so it sounds like you took that and somehow reared it or made it into your life's work. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, I did. Um, because I, I, I wanted to heal. You know, I, as I was doing my first speech, I was healing because my therapist told me the more you talk about it, the farther away it gets from you, it becomes a memory. And I didn't want to live in that space. I didn't want to live in that fear. I didn't want to live in that. Um, I'm, I'm totally, I'm, I'm totally uh, ruined for life. Right. Mm -hmm. Just like I'm, I really know, I know truthfully I know that when children are even if it's just that they're ignored as a child or they're neglected they don't have to have physical bruises I didn't have physical bruises I didn't have cuts I, well I didn't have a, a lot of physical stuff going on but at not, that was my nighttime life that I didn't have any memory of right and that's what happens to children even if it's just the fact that they're ignored in their life because they need that reflection that mirroring back and forth you exist and you are such a wonderful beautiful child mm -hmm. you they need that and if they don't get that they're just as wounded as I have been you know they're not it isn't uh I I have a hard time doing the comparison stuff Mm -hmm. Because I know, of course, when I say it, people are going to say, oh, that's horrific. But yeah. you know, what? it's even more horrific when a woman grows up and doesn't have a childhood that she can look back on and say, my mom loved me so much mm -hmm. that she would have died for me. Mm -hmm. I didn't have that, but I, but I, I see that in so many women and they don't think that that affected them. Yeah. But yeah, the, it affects every decision they make every day. And when you wake up in the morning and the first thing you do is you've got, I got to get this done because blah, blah, blah. Well, the because part after that is like ridiculous, but I got to get this done mm -hmm. is about proving your worth to other people. And especially in a woman's mind to her mother, because that's her first love. So mm -hmm. when she, when we wake up in the morning and we don't have that feeling of 
oh man, this is a great day and I'm going to intend to have play in my life. If you don't have that, then there's some healing that needs to be done around that mother wound that you didn't get what you needed. Mm -hmm. and, and then, so I'm saying to myself, and you're wondering probably, why are you com not comparing the two? Because they're, one is really horrific and the other one is, well, it's you know, normal. No, it's not normal. It should not be normal. It shouldn't be normal for anybody to harm another child. It shouldn't be normal for there to be sex trafficking. There shouldn't be normal for a mother to ignore her child, her daughter, or her son. But in this case, the daughter, because that's our where we get our validation for hu being human beings that you know we relate consciously to other people mm -hmm. so we shouldn't have to we shouldn't have to struggle mm -hmm. to have our work mm -hmm. and so the comparison thing is like yours is just as bad as mine now, mine may be like you know crazy mm -hmm. but, it, but it's really just as crazy for a mother not to love her daughter I like that because that's actually what was my intention is to bring in um, the fact like that people, how it applies to many of us, that it doesn't have to be that extreme scenario. Mm -hmm. It mm -hmm. can be, like you said, neglect, um, not meeting emotional safety needs mm -hmm. that a child cannot provide for themselves. Right. Like in right. my scenario, it wasn't... Um, there was no physical, but there was tremendous emotional mm -hmm. and safety, like avoiding my dad, like being so fearful of my dad, just emotionally. He never, he wasn't beating me or anything, but like the way kind of the tone was set at the house, oh, there was yeah. just fear, mm -hmm. you know, and unpredictability and like of like your parent not having your back. Yeah. So I think that so many. So I wanted to ask you, like, for people who do struggle with play and who are overly serious, serious, mm -hmm. um, because I was made to uh, enroll in music school in addition to elementary school, right? So it was like morning you go to the elementary school, afterwards every day you have like all these music classes. Saturday, Sundays, you have to practice by piano. You can't go play with the kids. And it's like the fun and play systematically, you know, you had to start over functioning and you're afraid of all these big humans, right. you know, right. who have control over your life because mm -hmm. you depend on them. Mm -hmm. And you're just like, kind of become a little grown up, <laughs> you know, very that's right. fun. Yeah, that's right. And you know, that's not fair. It isn't fair of our parents to do that to us or to uh, an older sister to have us, you know, be there for them as opposed to the, be our protectors as infants and toddlers. You know, I don't I that isn't fair. And I don't know. The, the world isn't fair. I, I, I grant that. But if we're becoming conscious, then we have to be under have an understanding of that is just as bad as this. Mm -hmm. Right. And, e and we have to get through that acceptance, forgiveness, and then moving forward in our lives with um, the, the opportunities that we give ourselves, because nobody's going to give them to us. You give ourselves opportunities to play, to, mm -hmm. to have joy, to bring joy into our lives. And, and that can be um, reading uh, uplifting books every day, every, you know, it can be uh, listening to your favorite music and jamming in your living room, you know, uh, to me, going to those lessons, those music lessons, that could have been torture <laughs> because, because that felt like a, I have to perform. I have to do it right in order right. for them to love me. Right. Yay. If you have to prove yourself that you are lovable, then yeah. they don't get it. They didn't get it. They don't know that they have a, this essence, this radiant being in front of them, this sacred being in front of them. And that's their responsibility to give us nurturing, protection, and love. And mm -hmm. if they don't, then they've missed the boat. And we have to heal that wound. So to your point, yes, so many of us were not validated right and provided that emotional safety and that 
like somebody being there right yeah. versus being stuck in their own issues right and emotionally right. not really ready to have a child and tend to a child's needs right. so if we realize like no comparison needed um that yeah i mean it happened to us mm -hmm. how like how do we heal that in our child well i had to get <laughs> it's really interesting that you should ask that. Um, when I was going through the first of recovery, I, I had never had any soft uh, animals or dolls when I was a kid. So I started getting stuffed animals and I would ask each of my parts, what would you like? And then we'd go to the store and they'd buy an elephant, a teddy bear, a, a bunny rabbit, something, you know, something soft. And I kind of put that aside as I got to these adult years when I'm just kind of living my life, right? And then all of a sudden I realized I need to have something that represents my inner child because I couldn't get that. So what I did was I went to Walmart and got myself a little baby doll with a little blanket and I carried her around, stuck her in my shirt and made sure she was next to my skin. And I said, that's my inner child. It was representative. Now, some people can do it without that physical representation but i couldn't because i couldn't visualize what my inner child would look like or or feel like mm -hmm. until until it took me a while so now i can do that but i still have her on my bed i, love that. I, I still have her on my bed and if i need it i can carry her around if i feel as if i'm being disconnected from her mm -hmm. then i can put her back on my chest you know so that's as somebody like who might kind of relate and might you know have some sadness right so uh, some unmet needs from the childhood that could be one of the things I can tell you that I wanted a Barbie so bad and I never got it my cousin had it and I threw her Barbie and broke it because I was you know there was some kind of acting out right from like as a kid uh subconsciously and then I think a couple of years ago I went ahead and bought myself a Barbie and it's sitting wow. by my bed and I also actually have a couple of printed pictures and frames of my wow. younger self awesome I have that too actually above me right here you know um the movie, when the movie came out, Barbie, I was like, everybody's going to get a Barbie because that didn't get it as an adult, right? That's going to be so awesome. Everybody's going to enjoy that. So I get that. I get that. You have to have something from your past that you didn't get mm -hmm. and you bring it into your present that, yeah. that allows you to have that. Oh yeah. See, I got it. Yeah. That's what I did. That's what I did with all those stuffed animals. So now periodically I give them away to people who are working on their issues and they don't have um, anything soft. And I also am a, I'm a reading buddy for the elementary school here. And mm -hmm. so once a month I go and I, I'm with a fourth grader and we talk about books that we were reading together and we talk about lots of different things. And mm -hmm. one of them is autistic. And uh, so I brought him a little, a, a, I don't know if you know this one. It's a figment of the imagination. He's purple dragon. Okay. And, okay. and, and he just loved that animal that he can't, he doesn't read, you know, he can't even spell his name, but he took that animal and he did the, what I did with my baby doll. He put it right up against his chest mm -hmm. and snuggles his nose into that dragon. And it was just the cutest thing. And he's a fourth grader, 10 years old. And he's, he's getting it, you know, he's getting some comfort from that thing that I gave him. I love that. So it's kind of like, it might sound silly, right? When you're grown up, mm -hmm. but there's some kind of visceral, right? Um, yep. Like when, if you, if somebody is experiencing like fear or some kind of even stuckness, when you want to manifest something next mm -hmm. level, but you're hitting a wall, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe there is value in connecting and starting to see connect with and soothe your inner child because I actually even kind of connected with this um 
some of the exercises almost like talking to her right yeah. writing some of the like that you are lovable you're safe and I mean it's brought me to tears mm -hmm. I think that's some of the healing that we can do and to literally because I feel like some of the manifestation and some of the like disconnection that I've experienced from uh, my inner guidance right mm -hmm. feeling that I don't hear my own intuition or kind of my own direction yeah. is is that like that the direction comes from your inner child or That's that right. connection to your inner child well the inner child is symbolic of spirit you know because we're we're energy and we have that download that we have every once in a while we recognize oh yeah that's what I got but in reality that lives in us all the time we just have to become aware of it so having that representation allows us to be more aware of it and speaking to it in con in um, these kind words and loving words and reassuring you're safe I'm going to keep you safe is is um basically allowing that part of us to expand open up and and uh, allow us more downloads allow us to know why we're here why you know all of it and and feel love for ourselves that we wouldn't have had before mm. so i recommend <laughs> i recommend i have a client who i've told go to walmart mm. and get a onesie from a toddler of six months nine months and a year and hold them up to your chest and realize how small you were when you started uh, shutting down. Mm. And when she started that, she was like, I can't do that. I said, well, the next time we came back, I didn't do it. I said, then go back and do it. And it took her three times to actually be able to do it. And she stood in Walmart and cried. And she said, well, and then she came back to the next one. She said, I can't do that because I, I don't want to stand there and cry. And I said, well, then go buy them and bring them home to where you feel safe and do that exercise. And it has freed her up to allow herself to understand that she was too little to run away. She was too little to be between her father and her mother while they were fighting. And he was alcoholic. And, you know, just he, it's kind of like we don't realize and we put these these artificial or you know expectations on ourselves to have done something to help ourselves that we couldn't have done because we were little um and so having that representation and looking at that little inner child as a as a infant or a toddler is like she couldn't have run away she couldn't have told her dad to stop you know, she, there, there's that inside of me knowing that I was, because I was very critical of myself. Mm -hmm. Why didn't you tell somebody? Because people kept telling me, well, you, couldn't you tell somebody? I'm like, I should have done that. And then I had to go back and look and say, it started when I was an infant. It wasn't like, you know, it wasn't like I was 12 years old and I could have told somebody like I was going to school or something. I was like three months old younger I mean but you know we all get that we all get our critical mind saying oh you could, should have done something you could have done something no you couldn't because most of us when when we grow up with someone who doesn't validate us who doesn't recognize how precious we are then we get that from birth we, we don't it doesn't come later we get it from birth and we and then we get compounded through society and through our family clan, our, you know, our environment, all these negative things that press on us and, and say that you're not safe, you're not smart, you're not pretty, you're not this, you're not that. And so we, we gather that in and that becomes who we are. And as adults, we have to start flinging those things out and saying, no, that, that's not sticking on the wall. <laughs> that piece of spaghetti doesn't stick. Yeah, because I can, I mean, I've been, and still I think there's part of me that is, like, it just kicks in, right? It's even unconscious, that cr so critical, such a high standard for myself. Mm -hmm. And I know that I'm very, you know, I, I, I saw my mom being so, like, even now, like, my mom is in her 60s, still being so critical of herself like her appearance is not good enough like everybody else is better and triggers me and it used to trigger me so much like it's almost like if you hear 
I heard it as um, when she said, oh, this person is quicker, this person is smarter, this person is, you know, everybody has these things. And I almost, I almost heard it. She never said, you are not that, but this is how I heard it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you take it on. You know, there's a there's a um, person who does work with this, and his name is Pete Walker, and he has a a, a flashback. Um, it's free on his website. It's a a download of flashback how to how to counteract that, and also inner critic. So the inner critic, what I what I say is give it a name, mm. and tell it to go to the back seat of a car because you're the one driving. <laughs> and if they don't shut up, I put them in the trunk of the car. <laughs> so it's kind of like, see, that's playful. You laughed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, so I, I finally got to the place where I had to name that person, that that part of me, right? Mm -hmm. And so do you remember in Shrek? I love Shrek. I'm, I'm a big Shrek fan. I need to rewatch it. I don't remember the details. Oh my God. Then this one, in the second one, the he meets this other Shrek and she's during the day she's a beautiful princessy kind of woman right mm -hmm. and then at night she turns into another Shrek but he doesn't know that she hides from him so she's supposed to be going toward this castle because this prince wants to marry her mm -hmm. and his, he's like short and ugly and very you know narcissistic and just bleh and so his name is Farqua. Farqua. Okay. So I my my little ninja guy that's telling me you're not good enough, you didn't do that, you're ugly, you're old, you're blah blah blah. I tell Farqua, you can go to the back seat now. <laughs> and if you don't shut up, yeah, I'm gonna put you in the trunk of the car because I'm driving this car right now. <laughs> so so it, give it a you know the playfulness we, we get so serious about how how we're critical of ourselves and how somebody else did that to us but if we can take ownership of we're doing that to ourselves if we can take that ownership and make it a game like calling it something crazy like some people you know call it uh, what's the one that they're saying now kathy is it what's the name of the one that they're saying that um Oh my gosh, I can't remember, but it's a, it's one of those things like, you know, Kathy, um, it, they name them, they name their, their ego or their, uh, okay, okay, yeah. something they, they name the ninja, something that brings them. Oh yeah, that's her. Uh, okay. you know, no, you're not here. You're going over there. <laughs> like a character, some kind of character. Could yeah. Be yeah. Like, yeah. So some, dog, something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You can name it anything. I mean, you know, but it's got to be something that you feel okay calling yourself. Like I call my call him Farquaad. You know? Yeah, like and, and, and it's okay funny, because right? it takes the gravity out of it. Like, it doesn't make it like more serious. Exactly, because um, and that's what we started out with. How do you stop being so serious? You, when we see that we have these things and we don't, we haven't taken ownership of them, but we want to, because when we take ownership of them, we're going to turn that dial on the radio to something that we enjoy, as mm -hmm. opposed to allowing that little ninja, that little Farquaad to get into my way, you know, I, so I had to say, I got to make this fun or I won't do it because I, because I'm so serious anyway, you know, so we need to give the little ninja or whatever parkwa, or do we need yeah. to give them first a hug and say, Oh, I see. Yeah. you. I see you. I see you. You're just so cute, but go away. <laughs> yeah. 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 I love yeah, it. it. It's okay. You know, yeah. it doesn't have to be serious. Yeah. Because I mean, but I'm just thinking without just putting him or her in the corner without that acknowledgement it kind of also could invite some mm -hmm. sabotage or acting out mm -hmm. it yeah. be stronger oh yeah yeah you you they know they're there and and you say I think you're so cute why don't you go away <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah why don't you you know take a time out <laughs> go rest take a nap here's your bottle <laughs> yeah 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 you because know? then isn't that like okay we we are so hard on ourselves and many times we are not even aware it's just like running and isn't that like at least 
I've noticed and I have externalized it and been hard on others and critical of others, starting with my mom, like, mm -hmm. oh, where I had like all this judgment, you should have done that. Why didn't like being mad at her, criticizing her, right? So it's almost like you take that and then you project it outwards where others, you know, are not doing enough. They're not working hard enough. They're not accomplishing enough, you know, and it's just now wreaks a whole another kind of hell. Well, you know, I also want to mention this book that I read, and it's an amazing book. It's called uh, Queen's Code by Alison Armstrong. Mm -hmm. And in the it's a book about relationships that's kind of in a um, fictional kind of you know, writing, but it's not. It's um, about a grandmother who's teaching her two friends and a granddaughter about relationships. And one of them, um, gosh, I was saying... Her statement was, who are you comparing this to? And and comparing this relationship or this person to. Some kind and, of ideal and, standard, some sort of like. It becomes, you're comparing it to the perfect person. Well, yeah, who, perfect and, relationship, perfect everything. Yeah. But, but who's the perfect person? There are no perfect persons. There are no perfect relationships. There are good relationships. There are great women and great relationships, but there's no perfect relationship. So we put a judgment on what's perfect. And that often comes from our childhood. It comes from our mother, who's being very critical of herself, which you took on as she's also being critical of me because I'm not meeting the the, the standard of the perfect person. But there's through no being perfect. validated through her validating others, but not validating me, even though she said you're not this. But as a kid, I guess you take on, well, she's affirming that so and so is pretty, so and so is smart, so and so gets things done quickly. Mm -hmm. But there was never like, oh, you're so pretty, you're so lovable, right? There was like just this external affirmation without needing to say, but then as a, somehow your psyche takes it on. Yeah. There's a there's another person that you might want to look at. Her name is Kelly McDaniel. Mm -hmm. And she wrote a book called Mother Hunger. And this is, I think, maybe three years ago she wrote it. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. um, but it's about that first relationship that we have, which is our mother. We're in her body for nine months and we come out and the first thing you see is your mother's eyes. They should reflect that adoration that admiration that protection of a mother to a child and it, and if it doesn't then we take that on mm. and and we keep expecting our mothers to be something they're not it took me a while to finally get to the forgiveness of my mother because mm. she couldn't be mm. any different than what she was mm. she didn't make a choice to be different yeah. She made a choice to stay in a situation that didn't provide me with any protection, love, or guidance. Mm -hmm. I had to learn my life on my own, just mm -hmm. like you probably did. In mm -hmm. reflection, going back, you said, oh, I had to learn to be fight that. I had to fight those memories to be who I am today. Mm -hmm. I think you're gorgeous. I think you're smart. And I know that you get things done because, look, it took us five minutes for us to change a date, right? To get on here so mm -hmm. it's like your reality mm -hmm. the real reality is that you are beautiful you're smart and you're you can get things done but your reality that you live in is i'm not good enough because i can never meet my mother's standard got to get to a place of forgiveness of your mother and not have any other expectations of her because she's not going to change mm -hmm. And she's a good person. It just kind of like, and she, and there was this practice and thank you so much for the, I mean, the kind and beautiful and affirming words and energy. Um, but there was also, I was born in Soviet Union and there was this practice where they, in the hospital, took the kid away for three days, the newborn, away from the mother. Mm, right? Yeah, that's hard. That's hard. That that can be a very triggering, or not triggering, but can be a damaging, right? Damaging. It can be damaging because you need that in that very first look 
that beauty. reflection, that mirror of of beauty and uh, adoration from your mother. She's yeah. actually your first love. Mm. You know, and so oftentimes that reflects into our relationships with our next love, which would might be a man or a woman, doesn't matter. But the fact is that our next love gets what we didn't get. Mm. We get we react and we respond to that love the same way we did when we, our mother uh, didn't love us. We still come back and say, they don't love me if they don't pay attention to me. They don't love me if they don't understand me. He doesn't see me. Mm -hmm. she, didn't, she didn't say the right words. I didn't get flowers for my birthday. You know, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. We we put a judgment on the, our current relationships based on what we got as children. Mm -hmm. So also is it like we have such also a void and such a big, almost like out of proportion need to right. get what we didn't get that it's almost like yep. crazy for anybody to meet. That's why I recommend Kelly McDaniel's book because we can, and there are other kinds of things. We we reflect that into our, our relationships with money, mm -hmm. you know, and not family, but outside of ourselves relationships and our ability to move into a different environment. Mm -hmm. There are lots of things that that initial relationship with our mother does to us and mm -hmm. how it carries into our adult life. Yeah. And are we willing to take risk? Well, you know what? I had to learn to take risks, mm -hmm. like like doing that live video of me dancing. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I can't believe I pushed go. <laughs> you know? um, but the, the point is that I had to learn all these things because not only did I not get it, but I didn't remember half of my life because I was so split. So, you know, dis dissociative. Mm -hmm. So- so I think everyone can, if they are intending, if they make that intention, they can heal those wounds and move into a life of joy. Mm, I love that. And you mentioned a few things, right? Like from the soft plushy toy or kind of like um, establishing maybe a more connected relationship with your inner child you know, taking some, some steps, you know, talking to them, acknowledging them, you know, even crying. I mean, so many times I have cried and felt the grief, mm -hmm. right? But that girl, the innocent girl who oh, yeah. so imaginative, right? Wanted to play, but, you know, right. went through or didn't get, but like, what is some of like, so if somebody relates, right, they didn't get it from their mother, their father combination, what else can they can we do to grow that safety and i think it ties into when you said that when we are so serious right and we that vulnerability you made a statement i think that vulnerable vulnerable vulnerability can be safe or is safe because it doesn't seem like it it seems like we have to have it together we have to be <laughs> in control mm -hmm. That comes from our childhood that 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 I have to be in control because you were so out of control in your childhood, you know, and someone in your life had control over you. So it, it's an illusion that you have that being in control makes you safe. But so, we're taught that, like even at work, right? Emotions are like in many times they're not validated. If anything, they're like looked down. Mm -hmm. upon and that leaders have to have it together and be in control and push things drive things forward mm -hmm. well remember when freud said that uh, women were hysterical when they were you know having these um, okay. mental mental problems and he called them hysterical women okay well, over the years historically that has changed to the place where we now know that people who have their emotions are more authentic. People who can name their emotions have an emotional literacy that they that they didn't have back in those days. They didn't have the ability or the right to have their emotions. We were shut down generally, both men and women, but mostly women. And so as I say, as time progressed, we moved into this place of saying, I have a right to my emotions. And yes, certain businesses, I think that we have to, we have to make conscious choices about where we work and who we work with. 
And, you know, one of the things I got today was that we, one of the most important decisions that we make is who we hang with, because that will affect us through the law of resonance uh, as to our own ability to um, resonate out love and joy and peace and all of that. We want that. We want that. But if we're hanging around with people that are negative and gossiping and horrible, control freaks at work or whatever, narcissists at home, then that's what we're going to, that's what we're going to resonate out because we become, it's like, like when uh, women who work together or play together, they start menstruating together. <laughs> well, that's what happens. They re start resonating, their energies start resonating. So um, when we're out in the public and we have our jobs and we, all of that, we have to have to be intentional about who we hang with because that will change our whole life. Mm -hmm. If we if we can move into having relationships with people who speak about positive things or like to play and they're authentic, those kinds of things will reflect back to me and I'll say, oh, yeah. Vulnerability, uh, Brene Brown talks about it a lot. It's a very important uh, aspect of her work. Um, and that if you take a risk and something bad happens, mm -hmm. then that gets reinforced. But what I learned in my life is that when I take a risk, something good happens. So... Mm -hmm. I, I did that dance video, right? I have over 200 messages on that mm. right now, right now. <laughs> I don't know how many are there now, but uh, as opposed to, I didn't take the risk. I didn't put anything up there. And then I commented on somebody else's because I, you know, I, I couldn't do that. Oh, I can't do that. Mm -hmm. So the risk was do you want to be seen as a dorky woman, old woman dancing? <laughs> or do you want to sit on the sidelines and just congratulate those who did? Mm -hmm. So I did it. <laughs> and I'm growing. I mean, I'm every day I grow and I do something different. I try to take a risk as often as I can. because. But I also have to talk to that inner critic that says, no, 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 it's not good. You don't want to do that. Yeah. So I, have to, I have to talk to that Farquaad. <laughs> Mm. and mm. make make my intentions of having joy and peace and love in my life and um, play as often as I can mm. so maybe the invitation to anybody listening would be if you feel um like you have you can speak up right you can say your truth and obviously in work parameters right it's within reason um you know there has to be also emotional regulation and intelligence yes. um, and discernment these are all part of equations but if you're kind of habitually like swallowing your truth or not speaking up or in some kind of situation like the risk could be taking the risk could be just saying something that you're observing and seeing as true Mm -hmm. that you've been able, afraid to say. Right. Uh, you know, there are so many stories of people who speak up at work. In other words, um, the uh, the boss is being uh, autocratic. He's being controlling. He's being negative. Mm -hmm. So this person comes to them and says, you know, I'd like to uh, do thus and such, and I can show you how it will help the, the uh, group. If the boss is is willing he lets you do it and auto almost almost miraculously things change in the office well what if he decided no you can't do that mm -hmm. you have lots of choices which you know as kids we didn't have choice but as an adult you have a choice what you do is you go to yourself you write down the things that you want in a job what what brings you joy mm -hmm. all of the things that you see as a job and then you go and look to see if there's something out there that fits what you want, as opposed to what you can get. Mm. You see what I'm saying? There's a difference between accepting the things that are going on at work. Yeah. And moving out of that particular work environment into a job or a place of either entrepreneurship or another job. Mm. And 
having the things that you want in it. You can create a job mm -hmm. by putting down on paper and, and seeing those things actually happening I'm, I'm, and projecting it out there. And un, miraculously, things appear in the paper or online of jobs that actually will give you 95 to 100% of what you've written on the paper. Mm. I love that. I love that because um, it doesn't even have to be a title or it could be even what you were talking about before the people, right? Mm -hmm. It could be so important, the type of people you want to work with. Right, right. Customers. That it can could be, I want to be, I want to have a, a work with uh, creativity. I want to work with positive people. I want to work in an environment where the view out my window is gorgeous. I want to, you know, you know, you know what I'm saying? So you just put down the things that you would really like to have as a, as a work environment and then go find it. Yeah. You don't have to settle. You can, you can keep settling for this over here and be unhappy as long as you're out here looking for the, what you really want. Yeah. And then just go back to them and say, bye-bye. <laughs> yeah. Because it's somehow, uh, I know many people and I've been the same where you, I've been in that situation for some reason you feel stuck. Mm -hmm. You end up staying. You kind of like your mind finds all the reasons why not to look like sometimes we can be so afraid of the job search of change it's kind of like the same with, um, again, it doesn't have to be a horrific situation. It just can be a situation where you feel right. there's something more, you right. long for something more because you have to kind of put in this box and the box doesn't fit you and you can't bring all your gifts and talents to work. Right. You have to like stifle yourself, right? An expression. Mm -hmm. because it's kind of not the culture and it's not right. where the right. is driving and it's not that they are bad people. It's not that you're a bad person, but you might find a better fit. But um, like just playing, like looking at this as play and just even exploring, like you said, writing it down, mm -hmm. maybe even connecting, just starting to explore, connect, network, talk to yeah. other people right. and look at other possibilities. That's right. That's right. And you're, you're exactly right. You called it the right play with it. Don't right. take it so seriously because yes. when we get in that stuck situation, just envision yourself with cement blocks on your feet. Right. That really sucks. <laughs> yeah. so, but we, what we do is we start dissolving the cement block by doing that creative work of this is what I really want. And you write it down and I, and then you look at it and every day you look at it and then you, you, like you said, you make connections with people. You, you go places where, at the spot, I met some yeah. people. Go it was a, there are no co yeah, there's no co no coincidence. It just is like you put that energy out there, yeah. and it and the universe conspires in our favor at all times. Hmm. I yeah. love this because those cement boots or blocks on our feet are self created in many ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we call it safety. We call, mm -hmm. we start to internalize the familiar. We say, well, we start to source our value mm -hmm. and our security from the company, from That's the right. job. That's right. And it's not so. Mm -mm, no. It's a it's a lie we tell ourselves. Our minds are just absolutely phenomenal. <laughs> yeah. You know, they, in good yeah. or bad directions. <laughs> Yeah, they, they're just amazing little things, you know, <laughs> uh, because, because we can, we can make ourselves miserable, just like, oh my God, I love being miserable, <laughs> you know, but if you, if you visualize yourself, um, you know, when we, we say the word stuck, well, that's, that doesn't really, if you give it character, like, you, you've got somebody that will run a, a thing down your back and push you against the wall and you're stuck there, right? Just imagine that, or imagine I'm stuck, meaning those cement blocks, or I'm stuck, my hands are now stuck on the paper in front of me and I can't write anything, or I'm stuck in my brain, I'm just, I, so 
make that word visceral, like you were saying earlier, and like I use a, a baby doll, but but use the visualization of how ridiculous that is of saying I'm stuck and then like passing it off as, oh, that's normal. People are normally stuck. No, you create your own cement blocks. I create the glue on the back and stuck up against the wall. You know, we all do our own version of I'm stuck and then we can't get out of it. Well, I'm picturing yeah. like a swamp. Yeah. Feet are literally, you know, like being pulled sucked into the swampy water <laughs> yeah like the swamp you know you, you it pulls you yeah yeah so see there you go that's a, to me that's play that's that's like oh yeah Deja Lee, yeah you can use those words and you can say you're stuck and and what does stuck look like and then I start playing with that and I go and I laugh and then that takes me out of being stuck <laughs> you know so you how get, do we get unstuck so we okay if you have the visual Mm -hmm. and you can feel into it uh-huh you can feel into it you make it you make it real you make it visceral you don't you don't actually get somebody to come and glue you to the wall but but think about that how that's kind of like the three stooges you know do you remember the three stooges the the comedy trio that used to no because i didn't grow up here so oh yeah well that's probably true well anyway there there are lots of different comedy routines that people do and they do slapstick and one of the things they would do is you know glue somebody to the wall <laughs> or they put their feet in cement you know that's the kind of thing that that <laughs> is used in comedy those ex those uh extreme things you know well we laugh at that we go to the comedy club to laugh at people putting their feet in cement right but in reality that's what we're doing to ourselves so why don't, so why don't we laugh at ourselves like that's really good Deja Lee. you did a great job at that you know come on let's do some more and then I go no I don't want to do that <laughs> so you can move yourself out of it because it becomes so freaking funny <laughs> that you have to laugh and you get that dose, right? We talked about the dose and they go, oh, the more I do that every day, the more of that good stuff I get. So I want that, right? And I want to feel better. <laughs> so I try to do it. Like right now, I can hardly stop smiling and laughing when I think about all those <laughs> crazy things, Please. crazy things that we can imagine when we th say I'm stuck, yeah. um, you know? But if you make it visceral and you start laughing, make it funny, like you make it lighter. Yes, make it lighter. I'm not really stuck. I'm just kind of in a yeah. pause position. <laughs> yeah, it takes the kind of the the tension and the gripping out mm -hmm. of it and like makes it lighter. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, I love yeah, that. You can, you can almost feel your body release when you yeah. make it funny, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I love that. And I think yeah. that's what we all want, even through the things and mm -hmm. kind of through all the, the lists that we make of what we want in our lives, what we want to manifest and accomplish. I think that's, we want the playfulness, we want the lightness, we want the happy mm -hmm. joy. So mm -hmm. I love that. Digitally, how can people find your books, your work? Well, um, my books are on Amazon. I have four books there. Uh, one is called um, Diary of a Survivor, Life in Art and Poetry. Um, the other one is All Together Now, Multiple Story of Hope and Healing. And the other one is called What Happened to You? Um, it had to do with um, not, in, not um, in, intrinsically being a bad person, but something happened to make you do bad things or, or harmful things. And the last one is my newest book called Greeting the Day wisdom from my gardens, which I wrote as a, as a, a way to meditate. And I really, uh, I've gotten a lot of uh, positive reviews on it. So I'm, I'm, those are on Amazon. Uh, my website, I have two websites. One is um, dejalee.com and the other is um, the healing journey palette, which means palette of an artist palette where you have so many different modalities that you can use to heal. Uh, including humor and joy, you know, um, and so the, those are ways. Or you can just reach me at my web, my uh, email address, dejaleelabrier at gmail dot com.
Beautiful. And we'll include those in the show notes. Okay. And you also have a podcast? I have a podcast. Yes, it's on Apple and Spotify called Life in My Voice. And I'm on Instagram. <laughs> so I keep forgetting I have all those things, you know. <laughs> If you email them to me, then I'll add them to the show notes and I can okay. add everything so okay. people just can easily click on. Yes, yes. Connect with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you having me on and playing with me today. And ditto, same here. <laughs>